Hello, Cornerstone family. Welcome to today's service. If you are new to Cornerstone Church, thank you for joining us. We would love to help you get connected. If you are in person, please pick up a connection card from an usher and drop it in the offering. Or if you are watching over live stream, click on the I'm new button to find the form. Here are today's announcements. Signups are open for the Miracle of the Bible class. Have you ever wondered how the books of the Christian Bible were chosen? This class will take an in-depth look at how the Bible came to us. This is a two-week class starting Sunday, July 30th at 9 a.m. Sign up to attend at the info table or online. A couple Summer Nights presents a sweet and savory date night. Come and join us on Friday, August 18th at 6 p.m. for a potluck dinner with a few surprises thrown in. The cost for this event is $5 per couple and childcare is available, but you must register. You can sign up at the info table or online. The Bible calls the church to hold those in authority in high respect and honor, as well as lift them in prayer. This is good and pleasing in the eyes of God, our Savior. In this spirit, the men's and women's ministries are joining together in hosting a breakfast for our law enforcement officers to honor them and support those who are the light behind the badge. All Cornerstone families, law enforcement or not, are invited to join. There will be free childcare and registration is required to attend. We hope to see you there on Saturday, August 26 at 9 a.m. Visit the men's or women's ministry table for more information or sign up online. Finally, as the men's minister, I am pleased to invite all men to join us for the men's retreat taking place at Pine Valley Bible Conference Center this September 8th through the 10th. Registration is now open for this impactful event, so don't miss out. If you would like more info, stop by the men's table. Thank you again for being here today. To sign up for any of the events you heard about today, please go to cclb.org slash sign up. We hope today's service will be a time of encouragement and edification to you. Please turn your attention to the stage. Good morning, Cornerstone Church. How are you? Oh, I love it. Ready to worship. Beautiful. Well, listen, we're blessed. We have uh, one of our missionaries, our partners from Haiti here today, Tim us, and we're going to get to celebrate a significant milestone in their ministry together. So to learn about that, check out, the, check out this video. I just want to say happy anniversary to New Missions because it has changed my life that I get to go to a Christian school, that I get to learn about Jesus, and that it helps me paying for it because I only have a dad. Because of the new missions, I am a nurse and school teacher. I love you, new missions. We are very, very thankful that for the job that the mission is doing here and see this generation are changing. You know, it really fill up our hearts with joy. Today is a pleasure for me to wish a happy anniversary to new missions. So my life has changed because new missions helped me to go to the high school and the barber school. New missions have changed my life because I became a Christian here. It has given me a really good education, and currently I'm going to college and I'm working here translating the letters that the sponsor sent to the students. May God bless the New Mission staff, the sponsors, and especially the Talis family. Because of New Missions, my life is changed. I personally wanted to thank you for obeying the voice of the Lord. And you did just like Abraham. You went to a foreign country, knowing no one. And because you trusted the Lord, my life was changed. My family life was changed. My people in Haiti were changed, and they were never the same. Because of that gospel that spread throughout the country, I pray that when you get to heaven, there will be a multitude of Haitians who will wait for your coming at the gate to thank you.
Amen. Amen. Can you please welcome Tim to tell us? Now, maybe you're new to Cornerstone, and uh, Tim, uh, you should know, Tim isn't just a, a guy that New Missions hired to represent them around the country. Tim, how are you connected to New Missions? So back in 1983, my mom and dad moved our family to Haiti. My brother Charlie was with me, and I was 11 years old, and we camped out in tents for three months to start New Missions 40 years ago. So... This is near and dear to your heart. If, if people are familiar with New Missions, likely it's through our Christmas shoebox drive where you've collected a box to, filled with hygiene items, educational items, and been part of the, the thousand boxes that went out over the world uh, and a good majority to, yeah. to Haiti. Tell us, how are those boxes used? Yeah, it's a big deal in our schools because those shoe boxes are given to our students through our schools in Haiti that go home with them to their families. And I've had students in our schools tell me, and this is, this is hard to comprehend, they have to share a toothbrush with a sibling because they only have one. So that's how big of a deal it is when you pack a shoebox gift. But most importantly for us, it's the gospel message that travels with that because at all of our schools, we share the gospel. Our pastors are there when they disperse those shoebox gifts. And I've been in classrooms when kids make a decision for Christ because that day the gospel was presented when shoeboxes were being delivered. That's awesome. So you're having a direct impact when you're stepping into this ministry, and it dovetails with the broader ministry strategy of New Missions, mm -hmm. and a part of that is child sponsorship. I think we have over 100 people in our church family who sponsor children in Haiti. Tell us about that journey, and, and what, what does sponsorship accomplish for sure. these kids? It's a bit personal to me this weekend because I have two sponsored children that just graduated from our high school on Friday yeah, and we were sponsoring them since they were four years old in our preschool uh, to the glory of God. But here at Cornerstone Church, uh, we have helped, you all have helped build a church and school in Concrab, Haiti. I have students with me today for sponsorship from Concrab. But the sponsorship journey is not just providing food or medical care, although that's essential. It's the gospel message along a path of development. So we see these children come into our schools at four and five years old. They're educated, so then they can find employment, but they receive the gospel. I just wrote an article for our newsletter about our Christian teachers and how they share their faith in the classroom. In the first hour, every day, we have Bible class. And that's very intentional. I, I wish we would do that in America. <laughs> Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. So the sponsorship is really a discipleship program over time and with the local church in the middle of it. That's, that's excellent. So we see the intentionality, the longevity, long-term partnership and perseverance. And it, what you need to understand, Tim shared with, this, with, with us last night, that throughout the country, one international aid organization did an evaluation and about 15% of children graduate from high school. So if you think about the future of the country of Haiti, to, to look and see 40,000 kids nearly have been educated all the way through, that's a phenomenal accomplishment that's even more significant when we realize that these kids have seen and had the ability to respond to a beautiful gospel witness. So Tim, 40 years, what's one thing that you're celebrating or hoping for for the future? You know, for me, it's really the local pastors and church leaders. You know, we see the local church as the greatest force for good. You know, here in Long Beach and here in the surrounding community, what Cornerstone has done over the decades is the greatest force for good. Amen. And so in Haiti, we pray for those pastors and those churches because they're on the front line serving these families. And we just believe that the gospel is what changes lives. Yes, food and medical care, education is important. But without the souls, I've been reflecting on the scripture, for God so loved the world, you know, and we hold on to that love. But it's the perishing part that I've been really convicted of, that if we don't do what we do, people will perish, not just physically. I mean, people will, could die from starvation, but it's the souls that are lost. And so are we, are we eager for that, to preach the gospel, reach others, invite others, because we know that God changes lives. Well, Tim, thank you for being here. Your, your presence alone, your own personal testimony, your leadership within New Missions is an example for us to follow and to be able to pray for you and your team and, and the work that we get to do collaboratively. But let's pray now for these pastors and for the work that God is doing. Lord God, thank you. Thank you so much. 40 years of faithfulness, of sacrifice, fueled by love, Lord. Mm -hmm. Love for you, which then manifests in love for the, the children and 
and future leaders of Haiti, Lord God. When we look at the media, we see just often dismal stories, Lord, of, of what's coming out of this Caribbean country. But Lord, you're accomplishing a good work as we respond to your faithfulness to us. So Lord God, would we as a church continue to lift up in every way, new missions and Tim and his team, and particularly these pastors, Lord, hundreds of churches around the, the country that are seeking to faithfully minister your love and your word to the people of Haiti. And we thank you for the life transformation that happens, Lord, as they serve faithfully. Would you continue to equip them with knowledge of your word, spiritual insight, boldness, Lord God, as they preach, share, disciple, Lord, and represent you to the people of Haiti? And would hearts be open to respond? Would lives be transformed, Lord God? And yes, we pray the country would be transformed as well to your glory, to your praise. In the meantime, Lord, we will continue to serve, continue to be faithful as you call us. Thank you again for this work, Lord. Be glorified in it and through this relationship that we enjoy together. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? Let's continue to worship. Hello, Cornerstone family. It's so good to be here this morning. Come on, let's worship God, our true and living God today.
great way to start. See, you needed to stand for that, but you can sit now. And let's continue to pray together. Lord God, thank you. Thank you that we get to be here together as the church family to focus upon you, Lord God, and to think about our Savior, our Savior Jesus, the image of the invisible God who perfectly represented you, Father, to this world. And in doing so, softened hearts, turning them from rock to, to flesh, Lord God, turning people from darkness to light, turning people from competition and strife to, to submission to love. Lord, keep doing that work today as we open up your word, as we sing praises to your name. Keep transforming us into the likeness of Jesus and bless this church family. Bless us to be a blessing. Thank you for the ways that we are able to come alongside partners here in Long Beach and around the world, new missions and others, Lord. Thank you for the good work that you're doing in so many ways. Lord, this is a calling upon our lives. So thank you that we get to both give and go, to serve and to love, to sacrifice for your glory. And we pray that you'd use our tithes and offerings this morning to accomplish just that, to allow this ministry to flourish, Lord, here in this church as we disciple and minister to our church family, and also beyond the walls as we have a heart for the world, for those who are lost, yes, for those who are perishing, Lord. We pray that through our, our sacrifice, our love, our generosity, Lord, that more and more would hear your name. They'd come to know you, Jesus, personally, and they'd respond, respond to your love and say, yes, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior. Amen. Worship Him. 
So what does God see when he looks down upon you today? And he looks down upon us. You know, if you had spent your entire life, in fact, you gave your life, for a child that was in a burning building and that child lived and grew and matured, how would you feel about that child? So I would say to you, people of God, You're the church of God, bought by the precious blood of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You've got to be a beautiful sight in his eyes. Because you've not only been purchased, you're not only the people of God, we have the Spirit of God now who is going to instruct us from the Word of God, which is infallible, authoritative, and it will fortify you. That's why you're here. You're here to worship and to be built up in your most holy faith so that you can love God more because to know him is to love him 
And to love God is to serve him. And to serve God is, is to enjoy him and enjoy all his works. You know, recently there was a, a study done next door at the university of the questions of incoming freshmen. It was informal, but one of the questions was, uh, why are you here on earth? The major answer was to have a good time. I know you were in college once too. You were an idiot at one time. But you think about that for a minute. A complete abrogation of the one thing that is and should be true of all of us is that we've been made with a purpose to find our purpose and to fulfill that purpose that God has given to us. Because if you're not fueled by purpose, you will default to what is what the Bible calls a life of foolishness. Foolishness. In other words, a wasted, vain life. And that is such a horrible thing. But what God sees today is he sees you in worship, and he sees something he loves, something that makes him smile. This is a good, good scene for him. Well, today, this message is not one that is uh, easy for someone and some people to hear, but I'm going to tell you that when we get through this passage and through this message, you're going to be able to evaluate the gift of tongues. Now, when it comes to uh, getting things all messed up, I would say that the uh, early church of Corinth kind of won the prize, wouldn't you say? By now, we've studied through this book. We have come to understand this church was misguided about truth, was misguided about theology, it was misguided in its practice, but that didn't stop them from being highly opinionated. Reminds me of the guy who was driving across the desert when his wife noticed as she leaned over that the gas gauge was reading almost empty. Here they were out in the middle of nowhere, undaunted by her comment. Wives do make comments in the car, do they not, guys? <laughs> yes. This happens. This happens. So this guy's undaunted by her He hit the accelerator, and then he said, Honey, we might be almost out of gas, but we are making great time. <laughs> Corinth was like that. Um, was not a healthy church. They were divided, selfish. They were cliquish, envious, immoral. They were dysfunctional at the Lord's table. They didn't think straight about and mature about issues. So the chances of them getting things right about spiritual gifts was almost impossible. However, we can be thankful that this part of the book of, of 1 Corinthians is written to correct these issues because, quite honestly, we have these same problems in the church today. Three weeks ago, I introduced you to 1 Corinthians 12 and the teaching on spiritual gifts. And uh, two weeks ago, I showed you how Paul lifts up love as God's greatest and highest priority. We learned that without love, I am nothing and I gain nothing, the Bible says. So after laying this foundation of 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, Paul then goes into 14, which launches us into solving the misuse of the gift of tongues. So chapter 14 that we're going to take a close look at and examine today was written to correct the persistent abuses of the use of tongues. About 125 years ago, the birth of what we now know to be the charismatic movement gave rise to a modern controversy surrounding the gift of tongues that has has proven to divide churches and separate sincere Christians from one another. On the one side, you have biblical scholars who teach that uh, all the sign gifts, healing, miracles, and tongues ceased at the close of the apostolic age. When the apostles died, they say, miracles and gifts like healing and tongues died with them. Uh, they typically cite 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, that says, As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Well, I mentioned this last week in my message. However, if you read 
the Bible text clearly, you will find that it actually says that prophecies, tongues, and knowledge will pass away. It says, when the perfect comes. It gives us a time stamp on this. It says, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. The perfect comes only when Jesus comes again. By the way, get ready. The rapture could occur today. And I'm ready to go. Are you? I would love it. Take us home, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Out of this crazy world we live in. But until he does, boy, let's be on task, right? And so this, this verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, that I was taught was uh, the rationale for tongues ceasing. Really, you'd have to say, well, then knowledge and preaching would have to cease along with it. So, and that's not true. And it gives us the time stamp, as I said. So the logical conclusion then is that all the gifts, including knowledge, tongues, and preaching, are in operation today. Now, on the other side of this uh, in-house debate, there are charismatic preachers who teach that every believer is to speak in tongues. They insist that tongues is the number one evidence that someone has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They hold seminars, and I've, um, I've watched them, been to them, they teach believers how to speak in tongues. Their method is to command people, and I've watched this, command people just to start talking. They'll say, well, just start going ba 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 and just let it go, and eventually you're going to turn it into some kind of tongues. You'll, you'll obtain the gift of tongues. And many sincere believers have left those seminars deeply disillusioned because they couldn't babble correctly. Or they have left with a misguided babble. So today, I have two goals for the message today for you. It's a troubling issue. It's within the body of Christ. It is people on both sides, very sincere. Um, but there is a division when it comes to this issue. And my goal is, number one, clarity. I want you to have clarity from, from the Bible. And second of all, accuracy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you right into the text of the Bible, and I'm going to give you basic principles, and when you get done this message, you're going to go, the light's going to turn on, you're going to go, ah, that clears it up for me. I, I, I'll just tell you that um, last night after I preached this message, there were more than one person that came to me. Uh, one man comes out of a church uh, that's involved in the new apostolic movement, which says that there are apostles today, and all these apostles are now taking all this authority over everyone around them. It's a big power grab, and he says, I'm trying to stand against that in my church. Because I'm old, he says, they think I'm wise. I said, I'm going to pray for you, because you have a big job to do to correct this. Another man said, I, I grew up in the four square church. I spent 45 years. I never received that gift. I finally decided I have to leave because they kept intimidating me, that I don't have this. This is a real issue. I will not condemn other believers who may disagree with me. I want to you to make up your own mind based on Scripture. This is not a major doctrine, so there is room for differences in interpretation. Rather than take up a battle against other believers, what I desire to do is shed light on God's truth. And this is, this is an important subject. So, full disclosure, four personal confessions before I get into this. Number one, my professors taught me that all the sign gifts had concluded with the apostolic age, and I held that view for many, many years. In fact, I taught that view. Number two, I have very close fellowship with charismatics whom I love and respect, and as you know, I I train pastors all over the world, and they come from all different, from high church to charismatic churches to everything in between. I love and respect them and my family as my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I differ with them on the definition of tongues and how this, this gift is to be used in the church. Number three, I believe that God is still doing miracles today. I've witnessed healings. I've watched God do the impossible and just this week, as I 
have an opportunity to do a little shout out here to one of our live stream visit, uh, viewers in Oklahoma City who uh, this week wrote me and said, I'm losing my eyesight. My eyesight is just about gone. And she asked me to pray for her. I did. And she emailed me and said, praise God, my eyesight has come back. I went to the doctor and he's, he, he verified that my eyesight is back. So I want to give God glory that he can cause the blind to see. And finally, full disclosure, I will also tell you that sometimes I pray privately in tongues. I've done that for a number of years, and even before the service today, I prayed. All of this has motivated me to seek the truth, not from my own experience or from some fiery preacher, you know, who's uh, pacing back and forth, uh, sweating and wiping sweat and uh, shouting and all the rest. I, I, don't, I don't listen to that. What I listen to is God's holy word. And what God has to say about it, that's where I want to go. So let me do a little quick review of spiritual gifts. This is going to be a little bit more like teaching than I am going to be preaching, preaching a sermon, try to persuade you. This is more like giving you the, the information that God's word has said, the truth, and you're going to make up your own mind based upon the word of God. But let me go back and review on spiritual gifts. Number one, spiritual gifts are the product of Christ's great victory at the cross and his resurrection. We know this from Ephesians 4, where it says, but grace was given to each one, each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's grace. Therefore, it says, he, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And so this picture in the Bible, as I explained it to you, a couple of weeks ago, is of a conquering general coming back from war. And he has, he has plundered the enemy, and he's giving gifts. And that's the picture of the church. Jesus has given us all gifts, and he had to fight for them. He went to war for them, and now he's distributing them to the church. Number two, every believer is given a spiritual gift, a capacity to contribute to the health and strengthening and growth of the body of Christ. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Notice that. Everyone has a gift. The purpose is for the common good. Okay? Thirdly, by way of review, <clears throat> it's the Holy Spirit who decides what gift you're going to receive. You don't work for it. You don't pressure God into giving you a gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, All these, meaning gifts, are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. You have a different gift mix than other people. Thank God. You've been given certain spiritual gifts for the purpose of strengthening the body of Jesus Christ. But in the use of them, you will be blessed. Fourthly, spiritual gifts can lay dormant from non-use, but can be stirred up and developed. 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul writes to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Some of you have been sitting idle too long. That doesn't mean you don't have a spiritual gift. You actually have a spiritual gift or gifts. But you know what? You've only had your pilot light on. It's time to get the main burner to kick on, okay? So that's... Yeah, let's put this gift to use. Let's, let's empower it by the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit, and let's see what God... Wouldn't you love to see what God would do through your life, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, using your gift that he gave to you to strengthen the body of Christ to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus? That's really what this is about, isn't it? And fifthly, by way of review... There are three categories of gifts. I mentioned them in previous sermons. Speaking gifts, serving gifts, and sign gifts. Tongues is one of the sign gifts. Now, with all of that as background, let's go to 15 principles, which I'm going to give you, for the gift of tongues that will guide us in our understanding and clarify and give us accuracy when it comes to this particular gift and how it's to be used. The first principle is this. The gift of tongues was prophesied in Isaiah 28, verse 11. 
You can go there in your Bible, but there it is on the screen. It says, for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people. Now, this is a prophecy concerning the Jews. God said, I'm going to speak to the unsaved Jews through foreign languages. He promised that he would speak. And what's interesting, in verse 12 of the same chapter, the Bible says that though he offers them rest from their weariness, the Bible says they will not hear. In other words, the prophetic says God is going to use this as a sign to Jews who are unbelievers to bring them to Christ, to offer the plan of salvation to them, but they're going to refuse it. So how do I know that this relates to the gift of tongues? The reason I know is because in chapter 14, verse 21, Paul quotes from Isaiah 28, where he says in verse 21, in the law it is written, he's talking about Isaiah, in the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, meaning the Jews, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So, one of the first things that we learn is that God's intention is this. Tongues were prophesied to be a part of God's plan to speak the gospel to unsaved Jews. That's easy confirmation as you look at the text of the Bible. So let's go to principle number two. Principle number two is this. Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit to empower believers to fulfill the Great Commission. Now you need to go in your Bibles to Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one, and Jesus is get ready, getting ready to ascend back to heaven. And the Bible says in verse four, and while staying with them, he, Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now drop down to verse 8, where it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth." And so Jesus already is making a promise that something is coming. Something is coming, and the purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit is not so that people get a nice ecstatic experience. It is for the purpose of evangelizing the world. It is getting the gospel out to the unsaved. That is the purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit came... On the day of Pentecost, look at Acts chapter 2. Here's the third principle. The Holy Spirit filled believers at Pentecost with signs which included tongues. Go to chapter 2 of Acts, and in verse 1, we have the details there, the history there. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. That would be the apostles, the 120 in the upper room. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Two things I want you to see here in this text is it doesn't say they were baptized. It says they were filled, it's a different word, with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And what happened when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other, heteros, other languages, tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word unknown was used, some of you remember the old King James Version, um, and it translated this as unknown tongues. And a lot of people at that time used that English word and decided, oh, that must mean some other uh, unintelligible language. And uh, that is not what it's saying here. However, Acts 2.5 actually clarifies that it is true languages spoken on Pentecost. That was the real miracle that, that occurred then. These were real foreign languages. 
Look at verse 5. It, the Bible clarifies itself. You just have to read it. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That's an interesting fact. This was now the, 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 the Feast of Shavuot. I'll get to that. But this, these were people that were in Jerusalem from all over the world. They were Jews. They were there likely for Passover, and now they were still there for this feast. And the Bible says they were there from every nation, and at this sound, the sound of the Holy Spirit's coming, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. Why? Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. You see that? So it's real foreign languages. That's the miracle that happened at Pentecost. Now, here's the fourth principle. God graciously gave tongues at Pentecost, which is the Jewish festival of Shavuot. Some of you will know it as the Feast of Weeks, it's called in the Old Testament. It is also referred to as the Feast of Harvest. So God's original purpose of tongues was for believers to do what? To preach the gospel in the language of unsaved Jews who were visiting Jerusalem from all over the world. This is the fulfillment, then, of Acts 1.8, when Jesus said, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're going to be my witnesses, and you're going to witness to those in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So Pentecost is actually not only the birth of the church, is the beginning, listen, of the festival of Shavuot, which is the festival of harvest. It is still, in this church age, it is harvest time. This is harvest time. God's plan is still the same. Get the gospel out. The fields are widened to harvest. And guess what? Jesus pointed it out. Uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are? That shouldn't be. Jesus put his finger on it. I'm going to tell you something. All of you think that I'm the harvester, and you're just here to eat the grain. No. No. You're all harvesters. Every last one of you are to be out sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with a broken world. You see and hear about your friends and neighbors who are all broken by sin. Their lives are all messed up. They're all turned around. Their families are broken apart. Their lives are shattered. Guess what? The gospel will come and change that life for all eternity. So this is harvest time, family. We're going to be speaking about this this fall in a new series on evangelism and how to reach the world for Christ. This is, this is what God's purpose is for today. This is why Jesus has not yet raptured the church is because we are the harvesters. And so the fields are widened to harvest, but the laborers are needed. The job is still now. Well, here it takes us to the fifth principle, the gift of tongues is the ability to speak a real foreign language without previously learning it. What happened on the day of Pentecost as we analyze this text is that God miraculously gave these believers the ability to speak in a foreign language. No crash courses, no seminars, no translators, just miraculous speaking each one was hearing them in their own language. You know, this is really, in some ways, a reversal of the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 10, isn't it? God can turn it, and God turned it. This was a miracle when men said they're going to reach God, right? Wasn't that the problem in Genesis, the Tower of Babel? Oh, we're going to reach God. No, God reached man. What he did was he took care of the language problem. Now, when I travel from country to country... I always use a translator. However, a number of years ago, here at church, uh, I remember there's a Brazilian family who was just seated right over here, about the second row in, and they had a friend from Brazil, and this young man could only speak Portuguese. 
And so they sat through the service, and then they came to me and wanted to introduce me to this young man after, after church. So I was talking to them, and they were translating, and then this young man said something, and I saw the shock on their faces of these people who go to church here. And then they told me, he said, he just said that while you were preaching in English, he heard everything perfectly in Portuguese. What was happening? God was doing a miracle right here among us. And he bore witness to that that day. Shocked and yet God's purposes to do a miracle, when he wants to do a miracle, he does it. He point, it points back to him. It points back to Jesus every time. Now, a, a sixth point here that we can learn from this text in Acts chapter 2 is that the gift of tongues given at Pentecost was not unintelligible babble. Whenever you want to understand a biblical truth, you need to go back to where it started, and then you need to learn all you can in that moment. Tongues did not start at an emotional worship service when the church erupted into unintelligible babble. That is not the scene at Pentecost. The gift of tongues at Pentecost began when the Holy Spirit granted believers to speak in real languages to foreigners who were in Jerusalem from many parts of the earth. Look at, look at chapter 2, Acts 2, 8. This is their testimony, the people that were listening. They say, how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? It's a real language. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome. That's just all over the place. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own language or tongue the mighty works of God. This is not unintelligible babble. This is many foreign languages happening simultaneously and people hearing it. Here's the seventh point. Tongues is not a gift for the spiritually elite, but it's actually in the list of gifts, it's one of the lesser gifts. There's a, there is a teaching that if you don't have the gift of tongues, that you don't have the Holy Spirit. There will be some who on the outside, I would say, in the sort of fringe of the charismatic movement, would actually say to you that you're probably not even saved if you don't speak in tongues. And so there is kind of an elitism that uh, is a part of this. Uh, and to these sincere but misguided people, the gift of tongues is the ultimate expression in their view of the Holy Spirit's presence. I will tell you that if you want to know of the Holy Spirit's presence, <laughs> it is not just an emotional experience. It can be, but I'll tell you, it's the character of Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 is love and joy and peace and patience. That's When you start to see that, you now know the Holy Spirit is at work. The conviction of sin, that's the Holy Spirit of work. Exalting Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit at work, right? So, when Paul lists the gifts in order of importance to the health of the church, he lists tongues as last. 1 Corinthians, go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And here Paul says, <clears throat> and God has appointed in the church, now watch the language here, first apostles. Yeah, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that, uh, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrating, and finally in the list, various kinds of tongues. In other words, tongues and that gift comes in last. So when people lift it up and say, well, you have to have that, you must have that, you must manifest that in order for you to have the Holy Spirit, that is wrong. That is not biblical teaching. So when anybody tells you that you do not have the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongues, you know already that they're misguided and they're not biblical. All right, here's the point number eight. It is not God's plan or will that every believer speaks in tongues. Did you hear that? 
It's not God's will that everyone speak in tongues. This follows the last point, but makes a very important truth and statement. Does, God does not give one and the same spiritual gift to every believer. God ordained that the body of Christ be unified, but also diverse in our gifts. Remember, Ephesians 4, 4, and 5, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Okay, so we know that there's this unity of the body. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 29, there's a string of conditional phrases that ask the same question, that all demand a no answer. Now, I know in English we don't get this because we don't have certain classifications of phrases, but in the Greek language, it's far more technical than English. You actually, when you ask certain questions, the answer is already anticipated. It's already demanded, as a matter of fact. So let me read you a text. 1 Corinthians 12, 29 says, Are all apostles... The answer that's demanded is no. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. No. Not everyone has the gift of tongues, just as not all have any other gift. And so there are people who under the sound of other teaching, have found themselves deeply disillusioned and discouraged, have literally left or feel like they're in some way a second-class Christian because they don't have this gift. But God has not willed that everyone speak in tongues. Here's the ninth point. Praying to God in tongues edifies the praying believer but does nothing to edify the church. Now, there are Christians who like to pray in their tongue. That's great. Makes them feel closer to God. Seems like it's evidence of God's work through them. However, while such a practice might strengthen them, it really does nothing to build the church. That is Paul's point in chapter 14. Let me read verses 2 to 4, and you will see this point fully and completely substantiated. He says, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies or preaches speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who preaches or prophesies builds up the church. Do you see the difference? The Bible does not discourage praying individually or privately in tongues, but it does lift up preaching as the main method by which God is going to encourage and build up the church, just as what's happening right now. If I am not feeding you from the word of God, I'm failing. If I don't love you enough to tell you the truth, I'm not answering my call from Jesus. Because my call from him is to feed my sheep and to tend my lambs. That's what he asked me to do. And I must obey him, John 21, to accomplish this. And so doing that by preaching, opening the Bible to you, is building you up and strengthening you in your faith. Which takes us to the tenth principle. If tongues are used in the church, they are to be interpreted. Otherwise, the use of tongues is out of order. 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. Now, this is a problem I have observed as I've been in various churches over the years that are both Pentecostal or charismatic. And during worship, there's a, often a concophony of voices after singing a particular song over and over again. And all are speaking at the same time. It's, infer it's affirmed and encouraged as a work of God, as people shout and scream and as they babble and go on and on and on. Well, as I read Scripture, if you read very clearly this text, don't, don't take your, your preconceptions into it. Just let the Bible speak for itself. 
you'll discover that believers speaking over one another is one of the reasons Paul actually wrote 1 Corinthians 14, to correct that problem, because that was not what God has intended for the church. So let's go there, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 27. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three, or most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them do what? Keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Isn't that interesting? Now, that, this, is, this is how the church is to behave. This is what God's word says. And yet we have the problem today in many churches. The Corinthian church was practicing something that had gotten out of control. They were abusing a particular gift. So Paul writes to them to give them these guidelines. Now, next week, Pastor Dan is going to be preaching, and he's going to carry on in this text. It talks about order in the worship, and he'll uh, take you down that road next week. Well, this takes me to, to the, the 11th principle. I need to keep moving, right? The 11th principle, the gift of tongues is meant to reveal God's truth and not conceal it. Here's one of the problems with all of us, especially when you go deeper in the work of God in your life, is that spiritual pride can motivate us in some ways. And it also motivates some people to kind of boast about the fact that they're speaking in tongues. And they boast about the fact that it's mysterious in nature, speaking in a language they've never studied, never learned. They're fascinated with all of that. They think they're developed, you know, delving into the miraculous, and they are. However, God did not give this gift to captivate believers or to fascinate believers. He did not give it for that purpose. They say, Pastor, I know people that they're completely fascinated with it. They're focused on it. They're obsessed with it. That's not why God gave it. Again, go to the clear reading of Scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 6 through 12. Notice Paul's correction. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? You know, if I don't come to you and I give you something, what, what, what's, what good is it? Verse 7, if even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? In other words, you can't know the melody. If the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? You know, the bugle tells you, you know, it's time, it's taps, you know, time to go to bed, or it's time to rise in the morning, or it's time to go battle, or it's time to retreat. You know, if there's an unintelligible sound, right? Uh, it's indistinct. Verse 9, so with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligent, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in doing what? Building up the church. And he already told you how you're going to do that. You're going to speak. You're going to preach. You're going to teach in languages that people understand. So Paul uses these two illustrations to get his point across. If an instrument does not play the melody, how can anyone, anyone identify the tune and sing along with it? If a bugler doesn't to blow the command, how will the troops know what they're supposed to do? The issue is clarity and intelligible speech based upon God's revelation of his word. Now, here's point number 12. In the church, preaching with clarity is to be preferred over the exercise of tongues. Again, the Apostle Paul writing to correct the church and give it clarity. Verses 18 and 19. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, church, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my mind 
in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Think of that. Five words versus 10,000 words. How much more valuable is preaching than exercising a tongue? You can see it for yourself. Now, let me move on. Tongues is not, not the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that this doctrine is taught. Uh, it's on the books of doctrinal statements of my brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it be the Assemblies of God or certain Pentecostal churches or Foursquare. I had a man last night, and I tell you, he came to me 45 years in the Foursquare church. He says, I never spoke in tongues. I had to leave that place. I thought, what's wrong with me? I finally left. He says, last night, he says, this is the first time I've ever understood tongues from the Bible. The fact is, is that many are taught falsely that tongues is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is not true. When Jesus promised that he would baptize the church in the Holy Spirit in Acts 1, he didn't qualify it with, but beware, some of you will not be baptized, while others of you, special to me, will be baptized. He didn't say that, did he? As a matter of fact, there's one teaching verse on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need to see it. Maybe you should underline it. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It clarifies this whole issue. It says, For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. Do you see that? Do you understand that? Do you... Do you receive that from the word of God? If you belong to Jesus, you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. When you were regenerated, the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ. It wasn't some ecstatic experience. No, it's what he did for you. He brought you into the body of Christ. Now you were part of, you were identified with Jesus. You are in Christ. And he did it for all of us. I've got news for people that have another view. God does not have any stepchildren. None of, you're not some kind of a, a, a stepchild to God. If you don't speak in tongues, it's just not your gift. That's all. So we all have been adopted into the family of God through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to wait for the baptism or pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the status already of all the children of God. All right. I've only got two more. <laughs> all right. So here's 14. We are not to forbid speaking in tongues, but we are to test the Spirit empowering the tongue. Again, the Bible, first. Corinthians 14, 39. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy or to preach the word of God and do not forbid speaking in tongues. It is not my job to go around and ban every believer who is trying to speak a language. Let's not condemn this gift as bogus. It's not my job to go around and be the Tongues police, I'm not going to do that, okay? It's, it's just silly, all right? But it is our job to practice biblical worship and the use of the gifts in alignment with Scripture, including tongues. This is what is meant in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, where it says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You need to hear this, <clears throat> We are living in the last days. Jesus warned all of his followers that in the last days, many false Christs will arise. They are all over the media. They're all over the internet. They're all over television. And they're, they're confusing 
the people of God and many Christians ignorantly follow them and give their money to them. I warn you against this. Jesus told us to beware of this. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What does that mean? That means that whatever God has revealed through the prophets and the apostles, everything has been done. And everything that anyone should say about it should be under the authority of the word of God that's already written. We don't need any new revelation. You remember when Dr. Malatu, Simon Malatu, uh, he's overseeing, what, 8 to 10 million people in Ethiopia in the Kalihewa church. He stood before us. He said one of the biggest problems is we have people, you know, putting up tents and going on television in Ethiopia. What are they saying? I got a new word from the Lord. How many times have you heard that? I got a new revelation from God. When you hear that, run the other way. Run the other, listen to me, church, run the other way. There is nothing more to be said than what's been given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the word of God. We've got plenty to work on. We don't need any something new that's false. We've got plenty to work on right now, right here between these covers, right now. We've got plenty. And so the word of God is complete, it's sufficient for what we need as believers. Now, I need to caution you in one other way about this whole tongues thing. You need to understand that there is evidence that worshipers in other religions and cults babble in unintelligible ways. The reason I say this, and by way of warning, is because Satan is a master counterfeiter master at it and boy do i hate him and you better hate him too because he's been attacking you and your children that you love and the people you care about and the church that you belong to satan has been doing everything possible to to rip them away from your family away from god and you ought to hate him for it and you ought to command in jesus name and take your authority over him but I can tell you, he's a master counterfeiter. And there are people that will fake you out with tongues and miracles and what have you. I've even witnessed the fact that Satan can actually predict something and make it come true. Because he has power, you guys. He can actually speak through somebody and say, well, this is going to happen. And it happens. And everybody goes, oh, that must be from God. No, it must be from Satan. You need to test the spirits to see whether they are of God. That's why I wrote the book, Defending the Flock of God. It's because there's so much deception that's out there right now. We were warned about this. So any statement or tongue that is found to be inconsistent with Scripture is to be soundly rejected. Just reject it. Finally, here's the fifth, 15th. Tongues, knowledge, and prophecy will cease only when the perfect comes. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 9. But the Bible says, for, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when, here's the time stamp, the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. We should expect gifts of the Spirit to continue until the coming of Christ. Until then, let's Listen to the word of God. Let's obey what the teaching of God's word is. But most of all, as we learned last week, let's learn how to love one another as he has loved us. Well, I have one story to tell you as I close. It was a winter evening and a motorcyclist, it was really cold, really cold. He decided because... Uh, he wanted to protect himself that uh, he would reverse his jacket because the wind could come through the buttons and he thought, oh, if I put it on backwards, it'll be a great uh, way to keep the wind from coming through the gaps. As he sped down the road, he hit an icy spot. He crashed into a tree. When the ambulance arrived and the EMS tech pushed through the crowd that gathered, that's when the first responder asked the man who was standing over the victim, hey, what happened? 
The guy said, well, the rider survived the crash and seemed to be in pretty good shape. But by the time we got his head straightened out, he died. <laughs> no, I don't know. You, I'm glad you laughed. Last night, they didn't laugh at that. They went, oh. You got it. It's, it's supposed to be humorous. My point of the story is, God wants you to get your head straightened out. But he doesn't want you to die, right? Just, just stay in the Bible. Stay with the word of God. I sincerely pray that you have learned today and that for some of you, this will be such great peace and clarity about this whole issue of tongues. May it be so for all of us. But my final shot is this. Love one another. Love one another. Father, thank you for your word, for the clarity of it, for the purpose that you've written it, for the way we can now hear it and now apply it. May it be so according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.
What a great prayer, right? Lord, have your way in me. But I'm going to tell you, you will never experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Listen, if there's sin in your life. He doesn't give you his power when you're living with unconfessed sin in your life. And so repentance is necessary for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want to just give his fullness to a dirty instrument. And some of you have grieved the Holy Spirit of God through your behavior, through your attitudes, through your, your thoughts. I'm just going to tell you, Satan is making a big play for your life. It's time, it's time that that all is over and you turn in fullness and full surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ that he may empower you to become all that you can be. And wouldn't that be wonderful? All that you can be in Christ. What a wonderful thing. If you need prayer, we're here at the altar. Elders are back there in the prayer room. Let's pray. Father, again, we give you thanks, and I pray, Lord, right on this congregation, this beautiful gathering of your people, may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon them both now and forevermore. Amen.